The book of Malachi it is the last book in the Old Testament. Very interesting passage of Scripture here. Some very interesting things that God had spoken to the people of Israel, to, to Israel's leaders, to the priests there uh, in those days. And I think there's a message for us from God today in it. Have you ever been in that conversation where you just kind of had to take a, do one of those double takes and you're like, now, what did they just say? <laughs> did they really just say that? Some of you young people, you've probably been hanging around with your friends. You've heard somebody say something or maybe you were watching a guy give a speech or something on television or maybe you're just standing around in a conversation and you were just blown away by something that somebody said. Well, I felt this way when I was reading this passage in Malachi 1. So let's read it together, and then I will highlight the part that just sort of made me do a double take and think, God, did you, did you really just say what I thought I heard you say? So let's read it. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Okay, so let me just let you know something here. This is God, His words, through the prophet Malachi, okay? Okay. This is what he had to say to his people. God says, I have loved you, says the Lord. Yet you say, in what way have you loved us? Now that's a blessing, isn't it? How many of you parents have tried to emphasize how much you have cared and loved your kids and then they kind of want to look at you with this attitude of, uh, how have you loved me? <laughs> what have you done? That's a blessing. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord, yet Jacob, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated, and laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness? Even though Edom has said, we have been impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places, thus says the Lord of hosts. They may build, but I'll throw it down. They will be called the territory of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. Your eyes will see and... You shall say the Lord is magnified beyond the border of Israel. Verse 6, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am the father, then where is my honor? If I am a master, then where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts? To you priests who despise my name, yet you, sh yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? You offer defiled food on my altar, but say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? But now entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us while this is being done by your hands. Will he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? Now notice verse 10. This reveals something about the heart of God that's mind-boggling to me because here's what God asks. Who is there even among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? Now, what doors is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the doors of the temple. He's talking about the place where these offerings, these sacrifices are being made. And so he's literally saying here, I wish somebody just stand up among you and just shut the doors to keep this mess from happening. I don't know about you, but that blows me away. That God is at the point where he's just like, man, shut it down. Close the doors. Be done with it. God says, I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. For from the rising of the sun even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord, but you profane it, and that you say the table of the Lord is defiled, and its fruit, its food is contemptible. You also say, oh, what a weariness. In other words, they're basically talking about how difficult it is to serve the Lord. And you sneer at all of it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick, thus you bring an offering. 
Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and takes a vow but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. Because I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Sounds like Israel has forgotten where they've come from. They've forgotten where they were, and they've forgotten about the God who had pity upon their circumstances, delivered them out, rescued them from their slavery, and brought them into the glorious land that they now enjoy. God says, I just wish someone would just shut the doors of the temple. What if I stood up today and said God told me last night that we ought to just shut the doors of Olivet Baptist Church and stop meeting here together? See, some of you would sit back and you'd go, man, you're crazy, Matt. But there was a time in history when God said that through Malachi. God said, I wish you would just shut the doors. What in the world happened to bring God to the place where he would say something of that magnitude? What in the world was going on in the life of of Israel that made him say something like that? I'm going to give you a brief sort of overview explanation of what I see going on in Malachi. And I challenge you, I really challenge you to take some time and go back when you get home and read through it yourself. But here's what I see. In spite of all that God is, okay, in spite of all God is, you look at the very last verse of chapter 1. Who does God say that He is? I am a great king. And whether you want to act like this or not, I'm telling you, I'm going to make my name great among the nations. That goes back to a promise he made to a man by the name of Abraham, which he said through him he was going to bless the entire world. I am a great king. I am the true father. I am the true master of the world. So in spite of all that God is, In spite of all that God has done, in other words, right at the beginning of Malachi chapter 1, God says to the people, I have loved you. In other words, he looks upon their behavior as a father would his kids. He says, I've loved you, and why in the world are you acting like this and not giving me the honor and the respect that I deserve? And yet you look at me and you say, how have you loved? So in spite of all that God is, in spite of all that God has done, the love that He has shown to the people of Israel, in spite of even His desires for the people, that they have not, for certain, not fulfilled in their lives. So in spite of all that God is, in spite of all that God has done, and in spite of what He desires for them, they show Him no honor. They show him no respect. Listen, they don't care. I don't know how to put it down any more on the brass tacks for anybody. Okay, this is down on the redneck maiden kind of level for everybody. Bottom line is they just don't care about what God has to say. Just don't care. And so therefore they're giving their leftover. God wanted their best. He made it very clear in His Word the sacrifices that the people were to offer without spot, without blemish. It was to be the very best that you have. Bring this to me. Show me that you truly know what I, who I am and what I've done and what I desire for you by honoring me, by bringing this kind of sacrifice. But oh my, 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 how far they have fallen. No honor, no respect, don't care, giving leftovers. Whatever they want to give basically is what they are now doing. And I'm sure that they provide the impression to the priest there that they're giving the best that they have to give. And we're good at that. I'm good at that. I'm used to that. I know that. I'm not a fool to that. I'm I'm used to people pretending as if they're truly this or that when really there's a whole lot of other things going on in their lives. And you know, it all comes back because family, eventually I talk to somebody and find out something, so... I feel for them when they're trying to pretend. You know what I mean? It 
So the people have gotten to the place that they're just basically doing whatever they want to do, and on top of it all, they act like they've done nothing. And so you understand this brief explanation is trying to help you understand why the God of the universe would say, I wish somebody in the church would just stand up and close the doors. Now, the temple at that time, the gathering place for God's people, the place where worship was being offered. I started to try to think about this as a parent. You confront a child with their lack of respect for you and they say, well, well, what have I done, Dad? I mean, have you ever heard that? I mean, you're trying to deal with them with something that they've done to show a lack of respect for you and their response is, well, I, I don't know what I've done. We're trying to deal with them on a level of trying to help them understand that we can't believe we're overwhelmed that they would act in such a way that they do toward us. And it's almost like our response is, well, what have I done to you? Have I not loved you? Have I not provided for you? Have I not put food on the table? I mean, how many times your parents said that? (laughs) I mean, I give you a place to sleep. I put shoes on your feet. I put clothes on your back. I do all, how in the world could you treat me in such a way? So as I began to try to think about this from the eyes of a parent, it just sort of started hitting home about why, why God would drop such a bomb and say, I wish somebody would just close the door of that temple so that there would be no more of these offerings, no more of these sacrifices defiling my name. And I don't know about you, but when you sit with your kids and you tell them what you want them to do and then they go do the exact opposite, that hurts a little bit, you know? <laughs> it's kind of like, do you, do you not respect anything I have to say? You know, if I tell you to do something, does that not mean anything? Some of you parents are looking at me like you don't ever deal with this. You need to smile a little bit and say, yeah, preacher, I know exactly what you're talking about, you know. Some of you are probably sitting there thinking, man, them preacher's kids, they just bad news. But yours are the same way, so they they all come from the same stock. It don't matter. We're all sinners, all the same nature, so uh, whatever, whatever you want to think. That's basically what's going on in Malachi chapter 1. In spite of all that God is, all that he's done, and what he desires for the people, no honor, no respect, don't care what he has to say, offering leftovers, whatever they want to give, and on top of it all, they act like they've done nothing wrong. God says, just shut the doors. I'm tired of it. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the similarities as we look back at the people in the Old Testament with the way the world looks today. But what's interesting about this passage is this, is that we can see similarities between Israel and the way that the people inside of the church look today. Okay, so it might be easy to look at the world and us look at the world and we say, oh, the world is just such a bad, bad situation and all that. But I'm going to tell you something. It's not so much better inside of here. Or in most congregations that gather today. And I know some of you are probably already thinking, man, that's, that's pretty harsh there, Pastor. But think about it. Do we ever question God's love? Look at me, y'all. This means yes. This means no, okay? Do we ever question God's love? Absolutely. When our life doesn't go as conveniently as we want it to be, and we're crying out, oh God, help me, just send me one more pillow to make life a little bit more easier, even though that's not the way he had it. And we want all these things to be so convenient for us, and when we don't get it, we have to go through something that's a little difficult in life. Immediately, what do we do? We start going, God, where are you? God, do you not love me? God, do you not care about me? And we question that. And you know what I think, and this might be insensitive, but I'm being honest with you. I think for those of us that know the Bible, that that is absolutely 100% absurd. How can you say, how have I loved you? Let me just remind you something if you're here today and you're in this place where you're wondering if God loves you. Would you please for a minute just go back and look at the cross? Would you please just take some time And go back and look at the cross. But God demonstrated His love in this. 
that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Ladies and gentlemen, that wasn't his suffering. That wasn't his death. That was not his punishment. That was yours, and that was mine. And so to tell the world, hey, this is how much I love you, he died for us. So listen, I mean, I, 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 again, I, I'm not really being mean about this deal, but for us who, who actually know the Bible, to sit in a place where we wonder about the character of God and his love for us, that is so foolish. But we do it. And that's what, it, that's what they were doing. What's the difference? Think about it. Do we ever question the love of God in our lives? Another question, do we truly honor Him? Listen to me for a second. Do we truly honor Him? Do we give Him the respect that He deserves? I mean, think about it from your perspective. Don't think about it from anybody else's perspective but you. Do you truly honor God and give God the respect that He deserves? You say, well, I think I am. But listen to me, church. We don't have to be confused or wonder or think we know what God desires and wants for our lives. Matter of fact, He has spelled it out crystal clear in the Word that He has preserved for us for some 2,000 years now, really longer than that. Longer, thousands of years. I mean, we don't have to think, we don't have to wonder what God desires for our lives. So in light of what we know that He wants, do we honor Him? Do we give Him the respect that He deserves? Only you can answer that question. So on top of that, I ask this question, do we actually take His Word seriously? I, I mean, with what we know about what God says in His Word, do we take that seriously? I mean, these were the issues at the heart of the people in Malachi's day, and God's dealing with this head on. And for them, they weren't taking God's word seriously. I mean, God said, do it this way, and they did it their way. Today, God says, I want it to be this way. This is how you trust me. This is how you believe me. But yet, what do we do? What do you do? I, I'm not in your shoes. I mean, what kind of dad are you? I mean, do you love your wife like Christ loved the church? Do you raise up your children in the fear and admonition of the Lord? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, if you're looking for us to do it, then you're looking at the wrong place. God said, no, you, Dad. No, you, Dad. Don't put that responsibility on us. No, you, Dad. So how do we do with that? Do we take that seriously? Or we run around and we put more attention on the athletics and all the academics and all those other things. I mean, how do we really respect and honor God with what He desires for us as men? And women, I don't know. I mean, you're in the same boat. I mean, God's taught you what kind of woman to be, what kind of wife to be, what kind of mother to be. So what does that matter in your life? Well, I'll just show up at church. You know, God will be okay with all that and everything will be just hunky-dory. No, I mean, really, what is your relationship. Do you honor and respect the word that God has given us? You see, what happens here is, is, is really, I know it's hard to see this, and I know that these challenges just kind of hit us, and we're like, uh-oh, what's wrong with the preacher today? Is he ticked about something? No, I just honestly believe that there's times when what God wants to do is he wants to shake us up a little bit Yank the rug up out from under us a little bit and get us to think about what is the real foundation of our life. And so honestly, it's like with any discipline, it's like with any harsh word from somebody who loves us more deeply than what we could ever imagine, it's always for what reason? It's always for the right reason, isn't it? I mean, why is God dealing with His people like He's dealing with them? It's because they have forgotten what they need more than anything in their life. It's not just because he's mad and he wants to let them know how mad he is. No, he's just wanting to let them know, hey guys, this is where you are. And look just how far you have gotten from me. Look how far you've drifted. And so it's not an evil thing for God to point out in our lives sometimes, hey y'all, look, you've drifted. I don't know about y'all, but I, I just very vividly in my mind, when we as a family, we used to go to the coast, me and my cousins, and, and we would all get out there in the ocean and before you know it, we'd get to playing so hard, we'd look up and we'd be like, man, where are we at? 
Or we'd look up and somebody from the house would be out there waving, going, hey, get back here. We didn't know we had moved about four or five houses down. But over a short period of time, the tide, the current, had just pulled us away from where we needed to be. Sometimes we need that to be called to our attention. And Jesus has a way of pulling the rug out from under even his own. It's love because he tries to help us at times to see the foolishness of the things that we attempt to build our lives on. Helping them see even here, helping us see that even here, and I don't know, I mean, I can't see your heart. I don't know if everybody's saved here. But I do know this, that one day Jesus is coming back. Amen? And I know that one day God has promised the day when just like in the days of Noah, even though his wrath did not fall on Noah, it fell on the provision that God had provided to save Noah, right? Okay? But that wrath's still coming. And so for God to warn people and try to let them see the foundations that they have in their lives and that they are not going to hold when this judgment comes, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's good. It's a good thing for God to do that. Because a lot of the things that we're banking on are kind of like us trying to hide behind a hay bale when somebody's chasing us around with a flamethrower. Are you with me? Because I promise you, that ain't going to work. And all these things that we want to try to build our lives, we want to try to build our lives on our morality. We want to think, man, I'm a good person. I think Emmett White was a great man. I think there's a lot of people that would have stood up and testified. Man, that was a great man in this community. Man, he would have given you the shirt off his back. But I'm telling you, it's not his goodness that saved him. Amen? It's not his goodness that did it. If it's his goodness, then I'm going to tell you, Jesus died in vain. We don't need it. So let's stop preaching. Let's shut the doors. Let's go home. Let's stop talking about the cross of Jesus Christ if we can be saved by our goodness. Amen? Let's just stop. And see, that's the whole point, the deeper point with all of this. God dealing head on with all this religious activity. Because you got people, not, their heart's not even in it. They're just offering it. They're just trying to check their boxes, thinking that it's all going to save them and fix them. And for God to shake us and say, ah, listen, it, it, it's not, that's not really what I wanted. That's what, God, that's what David declared in Psalm 51. God, if it were really the sacrifices you wanted, I'd offer a million of them up to you. I'd give you thousands of animals. But I know what you're really looking for is a broken and contrite heart and spirit. One that realizes that we have no leg to stand on, that we have nothing of man that we can build our lives on and that it will save us. But God, we need you. And when we say, God, we need you, what do we do? We make his name great. We declare to the world that he is the great king of the universe, the great savior of the universe. Your morality will not save you. Your church activity will not save you. I love to see people busy serving the Lord. I like to see things happening here and things happening in your lives out there. But that kind of activity is not going to save you. It's not a foundation to build your life on. Your religious heritage will not save you. I don't know what kind of line of, of religious heritage you come from. You may not come from any, but some of you may come from a lot, but it's not going to save you in the end. Your preacher's not going to save you. The only thing that will save you is Jesus. And that's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, hey, listen, don't you dare, don't you dare ever try to build your life on any other foundation but Jesus and Jesus alone. Don't do it. Thomasville, North Carolina, back in 2009. Our church at Bethany, we had went down to Thomasville to help Kenny do a Bible school, a vacation Bible school. I thought it was really neat because Kenny was actually, he had developed a partnership with a local Baptist church there and was going to host the Bible school there because honestly their church was in big trouble. They had a huge building, tons of facilities, but I mean, they were down to about 15 or 20 people in a sanctuary that I guarantee you, you could have packed 500 people in. And they're down to 15 or 20 people. So they were doing anything frantically they could to try to save their congregation. So we went and we met them back in 09 there, our church, we took a team. And honestly, when I went in there and I started walking around, I started thinking to myself as I was walking through their facilities and seeing that all that they had 
that can be used for God's glory. I literally, in my mind, started thinking, God, how did this happen? I said, God, you're all powerful. I said, well, why would you have allowed this church to literally get to the point to where they're just about going to have to shut their doors? I thought, God, what in the world has happened? And you know what God did for the rest of the evening? It was just a one-night deal. It was a one-night deal. Of course, they had other nights, but we were there for the first night to get it set up and to get the ball rolling. And for the rest of the night, God began to show me why this congregation of believers had got to the point where they were just about to have to shut the doors. There was an incident with some flowers. There was a huge arrangement just like this on their altar. And for Bible school, we had to set up up here, okay? We had to set up and do some different things. So, God forbid, we moved the flowers. Are you with me? We took the flowers from there. We put them in a safe place on the side. But I'm telling you, when we did that, you would have literally thought we kicked their absolute best dog in the hind parts and made him squeal all the way back home. I mean, you would have thought we had done the heinous, most heinous thing in the world. You say, well, how did you know all that? Well, I just believe there were ways. You know, people are pretty secretive about what they do. Well, I'm, I'm sitting there walking around, and I happen to go through the church, and, I, and there was literally a lady. I thought she was going to have a heart attack, and I, I thought physically, y'all, she was in trouble. I mean, this is how bad it was. I thought physically she was getting ready to have a heart attack. And so I snuck kind of around the, the corner there. There were some people dealing with her. It's not like I saw her suffering and then I walked by. But there were some people dealing with her. And as I walked by, I was kind of hanging out in the fellowship hall or their vestibule back there waiting for somebody. And I heard them start talking. And it blew me away. And I heard them start saying things like, I just can't believe they moved in flowers. I just don't understand why they moved those flowers. Where are those flowers? And I've come to find out the woman had gotten so distraught because undoubtedly she had put that arrangement of flowers in there years ago. Now some of you are probably thinking, you know, you shouldn't be hard on that older lady. I'm really not being hard on that older lady, okay? But here's the reality about that night. That place was full of kids. There were probably 80 to 100 kids, something that they had not seen in that congregation for a year. And this is what God showed me. This is what I know. I'm not ripping the woman, but this is what God showed me. When flowers, traditions, rituals, etc., 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 become more important than loving people, then the doors are going to have to close. That's what God showed me. Now, I don't know if you should clap about that, honestly. I don't know if you should clap, but think about this. Think about this. I'm not judging that woman. I don't know what those fly, I don't know what sentimental value. So I don't want you to think I'm ripping that lady. But the bottom line is, when we can't set aside a set of flowers to love on somebody, to try to reach out to somebody, we got some deep issues, and we might as well just close the doors. There's another thing. There was this street girl, and I just say that not out of disrespect, but this girl came in off the streets that night. She was weeping. She was totally distraught about something going on in her life. Well, she came to Kenny. They pointed her to Kenny. And then Kenny, I was standing there, and Kenny was overwhelmed. So me and another friend of mine, her name's Ann Day, an older lady from our church at Bethany, we both looked at him and said, we got her. So we took her up in the balcony. And we began to share with her the gospel, or listen to her, really. We were listening to her, tell her about her life and all these different things and how many times she had tried and attempted to commit suicide in her life and I mean, I'm just telling you, it was one of the saddest stories as I heard her talk about her family and all those things. So here's the deal. The only thing I know to do is what? Share them the hope. <laughs> I wanted to share with her something good in her life. So we began to share the gospel with her. And I'm going to tell you something. That was just one of those times in my life when everything was right. It was a divine appointment. And I truly believe that God flipped the light switch on, showed this young lady what grace was all about. And she left that night saved and full of hope and joy. I believe that. I believe that. But you know what was interesting to me? As, and then again, just God answering my question as to how in the world could this church like this come to this place where they're about to shut their doors. 
I overheard somebody saying as they were telling the story about how this girl got saved. And here's what a woman said. She made this comment, and this almost verbatim. I didn't ad-lib nothing. She said, oh, she's just probably another one of them street kids needing more money. That's what she said. And so here's the other thing God showed me. When we forget and lose sight of what people need the most, then you're going to find you're in a place, yourself in a place where you might just have to shut your, your doors. Let me ask you all a question. E e even, even if it were somebody from the street wanting more money, y'all tuned in now. Even if it were a kid from the street that just wanted more money, let me ask you something. Shouldn't we as the church be asking the question, why are they acting like this? Why do they want to mooch off of people? They've been having trouble with kids throwing rocks through their windows. And all the people wanted to do was sit around and complain about throwing rocks through the windows. But I just want somebody to ask, why are they throwing rocks through the windows? Why do they have no respect for church property? Listen, y'all. Right here. All of that stuff comes according to God from Mark 7. Every bit of that evil and wickedness comes from where? The heart. Who's the only one that can change the heart? God is. So I mean, can't we have enough sense to look around ourselves and we don't see everything going the way that we think it ought to do, as hunky-dory as we ought to think it should be going? I mean, listen, when, when all that becomes more important and we lose sight of what people need more than anything, then ladies and gentlemen, you're going to find yourself at a place where you better just shut the doors and go home. You say, oh, it don't happen here. Yeah, it does. It happens in every congregation. It happens here just like it happens anywhere. Rituals, traditions, things like flowers, they all become more important. And loving on people. We lose sight of what is really the need of the human heart. Why do people act the way they do? Do we care? Or do we just rather sit around and fuss because, oh, somebody's doing this, somebody's doing that. Hey, there's a reason behind it. The need is a new heart, and only God can give the new heart. Belief must change before behavior will change. God changes people from the inside out, not vice versa. Do you believe that? Do you believe that, all of it? Now, ultimately, here's what God said at the end of the night. Because here's what happened to me. I started getting angry. I started getting up on my high and mighty. Man, if I could step on this chair right here, I would, but I'm not, because some of you would go crazy. But... Uh, Sacred cow there, but anyway. Uh, honestly, by the end of the night, I, and I'm just, I don't have to tell you this part, but I will. I might as well just throw myself in the boat, right? By the end of the night, I started getting ticked off. Man, I was up on my high and mighty pedestal, boy, and I'm the one down here in Thompsonville telling everybody about Jesus and all these evil people, their, their doors are just about to be shut, and I'm just thinking about how bad they are and evil they are, and I can't believe all this is happening, but yet I'm the, I'm the spiritual man, boy. And God looked at me and He said, you're no different than they are. And He said, you know how we get into this shape? You know how we get to the point where flowers and traditions and all this other garbage becomes so more important than me and people? You know why? This is because we forget. We just forget. Everybody in here, if I said, who is God? You could start spatting off, this is who God is. What has God done? Oh, man, you'd spat it off. This is what God's done. So what does God desire? Man, oh, we, we know it. But sometimes, you know what? Our heart <laughs> isn't in line with our heads. And sometimes we just got to preach to our heart and take our heart back to where our head is and remind ourselves
who God really is, what He's done, and what He really desires from His people. And so God was ultimately showing me, you know, people end up, Matt, in this situation because they forsake me. And they forsake the thing that they need more than anything, and that is a love relationship with me. And I do emphasize love, ladies and gentlemen. I do emphasize love because that, God, more than anything, Mark 12, verse 28, my greatest desire for you is that you love me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That is my greatest desire. It's not for you to run around here being busy and doing all these things. You know what? We'll take care of that at the right time. When I want to show you what I'm doing and I want to use you, I'll show you that. But I want you to get to know me. Guys, we can't put the cart before the horse. Because if you're trying to do that in your own life, you're going to end up like these folks here. And I know you don't want to be there. I don't want to be at that place. So I close with this. I close with hope. Hope is what? Hope is grace. Hope is the grace of God that looks down at a bunch of sorry, no good sheep like us and says, you know what? I've loved you with an everlasting love. And you know what I want to do? I want to so overwhelm you with how much I love you. I want to so fill your heart with grace. I want to so teach you by my grace that I change the way you act. I change the decisions you make. I change your attitude. And I develop in you a love for this world that you have never, ever known. God still wants to do that in our lives today. In spite of us. And that's what blows me away. Because if you're here today and you're shrugged back like I was that day in Thomas, well, you're in a sad place and I feel sorry for you. Best place for you to be is God. Yep, you got me today. You pulled the rug out from under me today. But God, I don't want to stay here. And the good news is you don't have to stay there. Titus chapter 2, beginning at verse 11, says this, that the grace of God appeared, bringing with it salvation for all men. See, that's where it starts. You must be born again. You must be saved. Well, grace brought that to you today. Jesus brought it to you. Salvation is a gift bought and paid for by the blood of the Lamb. It's here today for you to take it and receive His gift and begin a relationship with Him. But not only that, but He promises in verse 12 that grace would teach you. It will literally teach you how to say no to ungodliness and worldly lust. How many of you are surrounded by worldly lust and ungodliness? Raise your hand. Everybody. But He's saying, I will teach you with my grace. To say no to that junk and to say yes to what is right and godly. And he said, I'll tell you, I'll teach you how to do it right now in this present age. Doesn't just have to be a future thing. It can be a right now, present reality in your life. But you've got to let God use his grace to teach you that and change your heart. All the while, you're looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace, grace, grace is our hope, ladies and gentlemen. It is your hope. It is my hope. But what am I going to fill my heart with? Am I going to fill my heart with law? Law is only going to kill you. I need to fill my heart with grace. I know I'm a lawbreaker. I know I'm messed up. But grace wants to fix you. God wants to establish your heart in grace, according to the writer of Hebrews. Now notice this. Just real quick, bear with me for the gospel. At the beginning of Malachi 2, God says, I have loved you. God has loved us, church. Amen? If you don't believe it, let's take a trip to the cross. Man, there he displayed how much he cared about us and that he died for you. I have loved you. Even though we're unlovable, he says, I love you. Look at the cross. He said in Malachi 1, he said, I'm not pleased with you. Very clearly, I'm not pleased with you. But notice in Matthew chapter 3 at the end, notice what he says about Jesus. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You see, we couldn't be pleasing to the Lord in our own efforts, but God sent His Son who perfectly pleased the Father in every way. Can I get an amen for the church? I mean, man, that's good this morning, right? Boy, you get confronted with some sad reality in your life, and then all of a sudden you realize that it's not about you, but it's about Jesus' performance in your behalf. And yes, He, pro- he provided a perfect way, and He pleased the Father in every way possible. He also said, I will not accept your offerings. But through the resurrection, we realize that Jesus had paid the price in full. And God's resurrection of His Son proves that. 
There needed to be no more death. He even says in Isaiah, 700 years before it ever took place, he said, I will see the labor of my son's soul and I will be satisfied. You see, our offerings to God in every way are corrupted somehow by our mess. And the only ones that He accepts are those that we offer in faith as an offering of thanksgiving to Him in the name of Jesus. So aren't you grateful that God's not going to accept your offering, but He will and has accepted the perfect offering of His Son, Jesus. And if every offering we offer is in His name and because of that sacrifice, then yes, it is pleasing to Him. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. The Bible said, Cursed be every deceiver. I like what one translation said. Cursed be everybody that makes promises and they don't keep them. They promise to bring their best, but then they bring their garbage. How many of you in your life, you've promised, oh God, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this at the church. I'll make this happen at the church. I'm going to do this at home. I'm going to do that at home. I'm going to do this with my kids. I'm going to do this in the community, but you never have fulfilled it. Well, the Bible says you deserve a curse for that. But aren't you grateful that the Bible says in Galatians chapter 3, Cursed be every man who hangs on a tree and the fact that Jesus Christ became that curse for us that you and I, instead of receiving curse, we get blessing. Can I get an amen, y'all? Are you serious? I mean, man, well, I don't know what's up with the church, man. I realize some churches say, well, man, we just don't have that personality, preacher. We're just not shouters or hollerers. But, man, I, if that's the case, I hope you're shouting in your heart. For goodness sake. But that's the gospel to us. He became a curse for you, for me. I don't, have to, I don't have to live in the fear of getting what I deserve. But I live under grace. And I know because of grace, man, every day, every day, the blessings flow. And I don't know about you, but I sang the doxology for a hundred million years, and it never meant anything. But when God opened my eyes to grace and I began to realize that because of grace all of the blessings of the world continue to flow and fall upon me because of that man that's mind boggling I don't have to sit and worry about the next day because I know the blessing of God is on me because of Jesus Christ well, I'm excited I don't know about you there's a whole lot more to live for than yourself so get your head out of the sand. Look up. There's a God who loves you. There's a God who has a plan for you. And there's a God who desires to give you abundant life now more than you could ever experience on your own. So I'm just begging you, look to Jesus and be saved from yourself today. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for what we, the church, can celebrate today. Oh, God, rescue us from the bondage we put ourselves in. Lord, re re rescue us from that place of not honoring you, not respecting you, not caring what you have to say. God, I pray that your grace just brings us out of that mess, takes us back to the cross, rekindles that love relationship in our hearts for you, Lord, that it stirs us up so much, God, that we just begin to, to just be overwhelmed, God, by your mercy, that we once again begin to delight in you instead of the things of this world and ourselves. God, help us. Help us, Lord. Save the lost today. Rescue the, 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 the falling, the drifted Christian today. For your glory, move your people, God. Move them publicly, Lord, that they would be willing to just acknowledge where they are. Not to say you won't meet them there. God, you're everywhere. You're there. You're speaking to us, God. So may we just embrace grace today. Leave here knowing that we are blessed, knowing that we are equipped to do and make a difference in the world. In Jesus' name, all of God's people said, Amen. Let's